John. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, well, when I arrived outside the Sofitel, I was reflecting on the fact that when I was at Cambridge, a number of my uh, teachers of economics were Hungarian. And I was reminded of that when Melissa uh, led me into the hotel and we got stuck in the revolving door. <laughs> and I remembered immediately my Cambridge past because a popular saying among students at Cambridge was, what's the characteristic of a Hungarian economist? A Hungarian economist is someone who goes into a revolving door behind you and comes out in front. <laughs> it's a great pleasure also to be here for this one of the first meetings of the Daniel Institute. Uh, I'm delighted to support John, who's an old personal uh, friend. And if there is anyone who can promote uh, liberal centre-right ideas in Eastern and Central Europe, it is John. He is uniquely qualified to do that with all his experience. So I know this is going to be a great success. I was asked if I would speak about the impact of the financial crisis. That's quite a broad subject. Uh, I'm not sure whether I meant to look forward or look back. Um, I'm, I'm always very averse to trying to predict the future. Uh, one of the things I hated when I was Chancellor Exchequer, I have a strong aversion to, is economic forecasting. In the UK, you are obliged by law, as Chancellor Exchequer, to publish each year in a red book what will happen to exports, imports, consumption, employment, savings, investment, and you know, they're always all wrong. Uh, I've always believed with Dostoevsky that of all human folly, prophecy is the most gratuitous. <laughs> or as at a G8 meeting, my Russian opposite number said to me, uh, economic forecasting is like looking for a black cat in a room with the lights out, and the cat isn't there. <laughs> De Dennis Healy, who was one of my Labour predecessors as Chancellor of Exchequer, feeling the same frustration as I did myself, once remarked that he wanted to do for economic forecasters what the Boston Strangler did for door-to-door -door salesmen. <laughs> I always felt the ultimate in uh, economic forecasting was uh, put by uh, a conservative politician, Edward Ducan, who people may not uh, know in this room, who once said, uh, if you must, forecast the past, if push the present, but never ever the future. <laughs> and when you think about it, that is what most economic forecasters do on television. They just forecast the present. They take what's happening now, and they say it will go on. <laughs> the trend is my friend. And I thought that was the ultimate in human wisdom, until I once went to a lecture given by a fellow of the Royal Statistical Society, and he delivered himself of this observation. He said, the past, has its own uncertainty, although on the whole, it's not as great as that of the future. <laughs> and uh, I thought about that. And when I went to write a book about my time in the Treasury, I discovered how true it was. Because when I write, went into the Treasury, which is a bit like going into the Lubyanka prison, <laughs> lock, <coughs> lock you in a room, the room's all of red linoleum, <laughs> Your <laughs> and when I looked at all the statistics, I saw that all the statistics I was given were completely different from the statistics I had when I was Chancellor of the Exchequer. When I was Chancellor of the Exchequer, every day I read in the newspapers, and government statistics confirmed it, that I was presiding over the Lamont recession, which was the deepest recession since 1929. When the figures were revised, and then revised, and revised again, it turned out that actually it was the shallowest recession since the Second World War. So uh, I don't know what one thinks about this. One can think, well, the Chinese are right. They say the Chinese economic statistics are always right because they're never revised. <laughs> or, or you can uh, uh, believe Harold Macmillan, uh, Prime Minister, who uh, had been Chancellor Exchequer, and he said, 
trying to steer the British economy on the basis of the Treasury statistics is like trying to catch a train using a timetable from three years ago. <laughs> you really don't know where you are. And I think, as always, the ultimate wisdom came from uh, Margaret Thatcher, the boss of John and I, who uh, once observed uh, that Thatcher's law was that the unexpected always happens. Although someone told me that this law of Mrs. Thatcher was actually a partial quotation from someone she didn't like, Maynard Keynes, and the full quotation from Maynard Keynes was, the unexpected always happens and the inevitable never. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I think that is uh, true. Um, we, we, all, we, all, we all remember the times that uh, people have uh, failed to predict the onset of a recession. We notice less often how uh, they don't predict a recovery, and we uh, also forget how often we predict something which never happens, and we just completely forget about it. So with all those caveats, let me embark just on a few remarks about uh, the global uh, crisis. As the ambassador said, and I strongly agree with him, the crisis, which was incidentally the first global crisis, that is why I think it is so important, why it has been such a traumatic event. It was the first financial crisis in our new globalized economy. It was the first interconnected crisis. And the causes of it, as the ambassador said, were multiple. It was a sort of perfect storm. First of all, we had an old-fashioned boom and bust of the kind that uh, Gordon Brown in Britain said that he had abolished. <laughs> the reasons for that were interest rates were too low. Also, we, in central banks, targeted too narrow a definition of inflation. We targeted consumer inflation and ignored asset prices. That had two consequences. Firstly, that there was an asset price bubble. And secondly, there was a lot of reckless lending and borrowing. And that, in turn, led to bad debts, led to the banking crisis, and then led to what I think has been one of the new characteristics of this crisis compared with previous crises, the ricocheting of the crisis between the banking industry and governments. The governments rescued the banks who were in trouble. By rescuing the banks, they got into trouble. The banks then rescued the governments, and then the banks got in more trouble, and then the government had to rescue the banks again. The crisis ricocheted from one uh, to the uh, other. I think it all goes back to a famous quotation from Chesney Martin, the uh, former chairman of the Fed, who once said that the function of a central bank banker was to take away the punch bell when the party got going. And as uh, Chuck Prince uh, of Citibank said famously in 2007, uh, the party is still going and we're still dancing. Well, we all know what happened both to the economy and also to Citibank. I think we believed for too long in the Goldilocks scenario. The Goldilocks scenario was that growth would always famous quotes, this time it's different, would be higher than uh, inflation. Uh, of course, we all believed in uh, England, in Goldilocks. We believed in the version we grew up with as children, where Goldilocks came home, uh, chased the bears away, and would be eating her porridge. I'm told in the <laughs> actual version in Sweden, which was told by Mr. Grimm, and so that what actually happened in the Goldilocks story was that the bears ate Goldilocks. <laughs> and that would have more of a relationship to reality. I think one very important point about this crisis, which surprises me, is that people are surprised that this crisis has lasted so long. I don't know where we are, two thirds of the way, halfway through it. We're clearly not through it yet, and there are deep problems lurking in the banking system. But we ought to have learned from history that downturns that are caused by banking crises tend to last for longer periods than 
purely cyclical downturns. That was the lesson of the Latin American banking crisis, of the Scandinavian banking crisis, and of the Asian banking crisis in the 80s. In response to that, we've had a whole series of uh, unconventional measures that have uh, been taken, maintaining interest rates low for a very long period. In the UK, interest rates have not been this low for so long, for nearly 300, for over 300 years. And yet people are regarding it as the no, new normal. Is it the new normal, or is it an exception before the return to uh, the norm? And we've had, as the uh, ambassador said, this extraordinary, unconventional, unprecedented experiment with quantitative uh, easing. How has the world uh, responded uh, to this? How is the world now doing? Well, I think there's been a bit of a dramatic change in the way people are looking at the world currently. If you cast your minds back six or nine months ago, everyone was forecasting that the emerging markets would power the growth of the world economy. They would grow faster than the developed world. Since then, things have slowed down in the emerging markets, particularly in Asia, and things have picked up in the developed world. And this is going to be the first year since 2007 when developed countries have contributed more to world economic growth than emerging markets uh, have. The United States is uh, picking up, I think, based on a housing market revival and possibly the uh, consequences of quantitative easing. Uh, Northern Europe, uh, Britain, Scandinavia, Germany, uh, are doing uh, pretty, pretty well. Uh, Southern Europe, of course, is a, a different uh, story, though Southern Europe seems to have stopped falling, uh, although the euphoria over the fact that Spain, after nine quarters of negative growth, had managed to register one quarter of 0.1% seemed to me somewhat overdone. <laughs> uh, Japan is beginning to uh, move again with an extraordinary, I mean, we talk about the unprecedented experiment we're having in the West, but the QE that is being done in Japan compares uh, with no other country in, in the West. My own view is it will end in tears, end in disaster, but I'll say a word uh, about that. Uh, later on. I think one of the key problems that uh, faces the world is the banking system still. It is the lack of lending that contributes to uh, the lack of growth. Of course, we are asking an awful lot of the banking system. We're saying, repair your balance sheets, uh, identify your bad debts, and also lend lots of money. It's quite difficult to do all those three things together. One of the reasons I think the United States has done better than elsewhere in the world is that American banks have faced up to this much more quickly than have the banks in Europe. Over the last five years, loss provisions in European banks amounted to 5 to 6% of balance sheets, while it was 15% in the uh, United States bank. And so bank lending has been flat in Europe, and there is the possibility that it might even shrink. But I think that is one of the major problems that we face. We have never had in Europe the sort of rigorous stress tests that they had of the banking system in the United States. And I think there are a lot of concealed problems still in the European banking system. And by the European banking system, I include the British banking system as well. I'd like just to say something also about uh, the, the Eurozone. As, as John knows, the Eurozone is a subject very dear to my heart because I was Britain's negotiator when the Euro was set up. And uh, of course, it was government policy, but I negotiated our non participation in the Euro. And this involved my going off to Brussels once a month. It was the most miserable year of my life. <laughs> it was a dialogue of the deaf. And uh, I have never recovered from that moment when uh, my Greek colleague, who was twice as broad as me even, and three times as tall as me, put his arm around my shoulder and said, oh, Norman, you say no, we'll never join the Euro. 
but when the time comes, you'll show solidarity with Greece. <laughs> thank, thank goodness we did. I, I did learn one thing in those monthly uh, trips to uh, Brussels, in that I learned that the euro was a political idea, maybe a religious idea. <laughs> and it was once very well uh, summed up by uh, a Spanish economist, Pedro Schwartz, a Spaniard with a German name, who Antonio Martino knows uh, very, very well. But Pedro Schwartz once said about the euro that it owed more to Freud's couch in Vienna than it did to any economic theory. <laughs> and he said the reason the euro exists is uh, firstly, the French are afraid of the Germans. <laughs> Secondly, the Germans are afraid of the Germans. <laughs> Thirdly, the Italians don't trust themselves. The Irish want to be rid of the British. The Greeks want to face the Turks in the face. And of course, the Belgians, uh, the Luxembourgers, and the Dutch all want to dine at the top table. And the only thing that Pedro left out is he might have added and the British think they need have nothing to do with it as they won the war all on their own. <laughs> Is the crisis over? Well, if one puts it that way, I think there's a previous question. Which crisis? The euro has one crisis that metamorphoses into another crisis. Initially, the euro had 2009, 2010, had a sort of existential crisis where the stresses and strains on it were so great, the problems of the indebtedness of certain countries called the uh, existence of the euro into question. Possibly the euro has weathered that, but I'm not so certain about that. But now it seems to be facing another sort of crisis, whether the eurozone can grow uh, at all. And I think what's happened in the last few weeks, the last week has been quite interesting. We had, uh, as the ambassador reminded us, the uh, rate cut from the European Central Bank. Uh, what that, I think, indicated was that the European Central Bank is deeply worried about the prospect of deflation, about negative inflation in uh, the Eurozone. It also provoked a massive German reaction. Two members of the European Central Bank governing body, including one executive member of the board, voted against the rate cut and made it public that they had voted against the rate cut. And then on top of that, uh, Commissioner Olli Rehn, uh, the Finnish uh, commissioner, announced that uh, proceedings were being opened against Germany uh, by the Commission with the possibility of fines because Germany is running too large a current account surplus. And that, I think, will deeply offend the Germans. And that, I think, has opened up a wide uh, and potentially serious political fissure within the Eurozone. But it shows the desperation of some countries in the Eurozone, the fear that the export-oriented uh, policy of Germany isn't one that the whole of the Eurozone can follow uh, and is actually driving the rest of the Eurozone deeper and deeper uh, into uh, negative growth and possibly uh, de 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 deflation. So the question is, dysfunctional though the Eurozone is, can monetary policy really come to uh, the rescue? Possibly, but I don't think it's ever going to work well. I remember when the crisis, the financial crisis, first broke. This was labelled by many people in the Eurozone as an Anglo-Saxon crisis. The argument was it's got nothing to do with the Eurozone. And of course, after a short while, they discovered that they had exactly the same problems as the United States, Britain, and other countries in the uh, banking crisis. Some blamed the Eurozone crisis on the simply the deficits of some governments. That, I think, is a bit of a simplification. It's obviously true of Greece, uh, but it's not true of Spain and Ireland. In Spain and Ireland, I think the crisis was caused by the single interest rate, which was too low uh, 
for some countries and too high for others. And in the peripheral countries led to massive overinvestment in property and a big uh, property crash. Europe's response was extremely slow. Various bailout funds were created. The interesting point, which I couldn't help noticing, was that the bailout uh, funds that were created in the first instance were actually illegal, as uh, Madame Lagarde herself admitted. In order to establish the first bailout for Ireland and Greece, the Eurozone invoked an article of the treaties that referred to natural disasters, meaning earthquakes and floods. That was what they used in order to have the, the first uh, bailout. Uh, the ambassador referred to uh, the European Stability Mechanism, the bailout fund, the final third version of the bailout fund. Of course, I think the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism, illustrates how fragile it all uh, is, how it is rather like a pack of cards. Because when you think about the ESM, who are the contributors to the ESM? Well, they are 24% from Germany, 20% from France, something like 18, 9% from Italy, 12% from Spain, Italy and Spain, two countries that might have to use the bailout fund. So how are they guaranteeing it? And if they guarantee it, of course, they can't also be the beneficiaries of it. And what would happen if they drew on it is everybody else would have to pay more. And there is no way that the German economy could absorb a much higher proportion, could absorb a proportion uh, big enough to bail out both Spain and Italy were they to get into that sort of uh, trouble. The Eurozone, to my mind, remains extremely vulnerable because of the debt to GDP levels which have not uh, come down. If interest rates rise because of, let's say, the ending of QE in America, in the United States, that this could cause extreme problems. What calmed the Eurozone crisis was the assurance given by Mario Draghi that he would do whatever it takes to uh, save the euro. When, when I think about that, I always remember uh, a remark of uh, an English politician who may not be known to most people in this room called Enoch Powell, who uh, once remarked that a politician's words were his deeds. Well, Mario Draghi's words have been his deeds because he said uh, we will do whatever it takes to save the euro. That was interpreted by the markets as mean, meaning we will buy unlimited quantities of bonds of the peripheral countries in order to keep interest rates down. But of course, he didn't buy a single bond. But it had the desired effect. So in that way, it was indeed uh, a mas master stroke. I think the interesting point about the Eurozone is whether it, where it goes from, from here. I don't see how the Euro can survive without having a proper banking union, without having a proper resolution uh, scheme. That is a, a scheme for uh, allowing the disorderly, for allowing the orderly uh, liquidation of bad banks and having also uh, a deposit insurance scheme. But of course, the Germans don't want that because the Germans feel that they, uh, as in the ESM, would be footing uh, the bill. So my view is that maybe, probably, the Europeans are going to muddle through with the Eurozone, but there are lots of rocks along the way. Now, I would just like, if I'm not being on too long, John, just to say a word about the very subject that the uh, ambassador talked about, and that is... Uh, quantitative easing, the unconventional monetary experiment carried out by the Fed, which to my mind, the resolution to which is the biggest problem facing the world uh, economy. I think in a way, QE is a bit like the Eurozone, a bit like a lobster pot. It's very easy to get in, but it's rather difficult for the lobster to get out <laughs> once it's uh, there. And I can see the benefits that QE had in 2007. I can understand why uh, it happened, to keep interest rates down, to increase the money supply, to lower the cost of debt to governments, 
to help the banks, and above all, to keep up asset prices, because in this bursting of the bubble scenario, it would have been disastrous to have had an absolute meltdown across the board of all asset prices. This policy has very much been the child of Ben Bernanke, and it is an extraordinary coincidence that a person who specialized in the financial crisis of the 1930s as an academic has had the job of tackling uh, this crisis. And he did not want to be seen as the Mariner Eccles of his time. The Americans here will remember that Mariner Eccles was the chairman of the Fed, who by tightening monetary policy was given the blame for the second downturn in the depression in the 1930s. It might be argued that the way to solve the crisis might have been to let asset prices fall aggressively to let the market clear itself, but I accept and I understand that that would have been uh, disastrous and would have led to a prolonged deflationary crisis. So the object of policy was to buy time, buy time by supporting asset prices until the economy was sufficiently strong to be able to support this level or something close to it of asset uh, prices. But I get increasingly anxious uh, about it. We've had uh, five years of quantitative easing. We have a recovery in America which is faster than in most parts of the world, but weak by American historic standards. If QE after five years can't produce a faster rate of growth, why do we think by continuing it, it is still likely to do that? What QE has done is to put up uh, asset prices in all sorts of ways, in all sorts of different markets. Uh, bonds, <coughs> high yielding shares, commodities, emerging market assets, possibly house prices in the south of England as well. These are all distortions, massive distortions, that have come in because of uh, QE. As I say, I accept that QE was necessary in 2000. And seven. But you know, when it was introduced in 2007, people were talking about it being a $600 billion uh, program. By the autumn of this year, it's something like $4,000 billion. If it goes on till the middle of next year, it will be something like $5,000 billion. And the reversing of this is indeed a hugely problematic uh, challenge for the Fed. Like landing a jet fighter on a moving aircraft carrier in the middle of a thunder and lightning storm. It will not be easily done, and has to be done, I think, with great skill and great, uh, uh, in a very timely way. The risk is there that the bent-up spring, the expansion of the monetary base, may lead at some point to uh, in inflation. Other people argue, well, well, we've plenty of time to stop that. But actually, these increases in inflation can hit one on the face very quickly and very unexpectedly. And I think myself regard it as a good thing that uh, the Fed and Mrs. Yellen want to target unemployment. And there's talk that Mrs. Yellen may lower the target for uh, maintaining interest rates at their present level. She said she will maintain them until unemployment falls to 6.5%. And, and people are saying she might not uh, lower them until it reaches 6%. And unemployment is a measure which so many different bearings, the number of people uh, looking for work, people who retire from the labor force, it is extremely difficult, actually, to uh, influence. So uh, I personally regretted that the Fed blinked, and I think that's what they did, in uh, September, they lost their nerve, possibly because of what was going on in Congress at the time about the budget uh, ceiling. Uh, but it seems to me that all this has a profound effect on the world economy everywhere, not just in Europe, but also in emerging uh, markets. And I personally hope that, uh, although they can signal to the market their intention, I personally hope that they will uh, make up their minds and get on with it. Because you can't go on and on with this. Um, you can't go on with the situation until the central bank owns everything in the American economy. 
already the central bank in Britain owns a third of the government stock that is in issue. Uh, and I don't believe that a pure writing off of this, a pure monetary fan financing of the deficit uh, would be a good thing. Some may say that's just a taboo. Well, in my lifetime's experience, I would say getting rid of taboos often has very unexpected consequences, and I would be very careful about that. John, I've gone on too long, but just to sum up, I think it was Cole Porter had a song, Was It an Earthquake or Just a Shock? Well, I think it was nearly an earthquake. Uh, a lot of the buildings are still standing. The Rescue teams, I think, did a pretty good job. Uh, we're making uh, progress, but I think we have to be careful that we don't solve the crisis with the same thinking that created the crisis in uh, the first place. I think there are lots of reasons to be uh, optimistic. I think America, whatever its policies, has got an inbuilt dynamism and growth and this incredible innovation machine in Silicon Valley. The other great thing the world is going for it is the poor want to get richer, and especially the poor in Asia. And I see nothing to regret about that or feel afraid of. I think it's something profoundly to be welcomed. And for that reason, I remain uh, an optimist that we will muddle through this. I think it was Churchill who said, a pessimist sees the problem in every opportunity, and uh, an optimist sees the opportunity in every problem. And there are plenty of opportunities around. Thank you very much.